in the afternoon. I'm going to pay you all now. <laughs> Getting out my cheat sheet. Um, first of all, as usual, I'm going to say my spiel, which is I am on the West Tisbury ConCon, but I'm not doing this as a ConCon member. I'm doing this as a citizen. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to thank, first of all, the Edie Foundation, which uh, funded our water temperature study over the last eight months, and it's ongoing. We'll be having more data probably through the end of this year. Those little loggers might keep going. Um, I'm going to send around a sign-up sheet just to get a rough idea of how many people and who you all are. So I'm going to start it here with Eva, and she's going to make time to sign up. Yeah, you can only sign it once. Thank you, Mother. <laughs> so um, uh, the reason I've got Steve Hurley down here is we've, um, everyone's aware, West Tisbury, we've been talking about our mill pond and what to do if anything needs to be done. And um, I uh, come from a natural history background, and I early on got interested in what were any other options? Was there more to learn about Mill Brook itself, which flows through Mill Pond on its way to Town Cove? And was there more to learn about the fisheries? And so as I've asked questions, I've gotten to meet a lot of really interesting people. One has led to another. A lot of you were at the Beth Lambert talk in 2010 when she came down from the uh, Division of Ecological Restoration. Uh, Beth Lambert introduced me to Michael Hopper of Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition. Um, and since then, I've become a member of the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition's board. There's a few flyers here for anyone who's interested in learning more about our group. Um, I then got introduced to Steve Hurley, who is, um, what are you? You are a state fisheries I, biologist. I am the Southeast District Fisheries Manager for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. So I'm responsible for all uh, the freshwater fisheries of Barnstable, Bristol, Dukes, Nantucket, and Plymouth Pines. That's who you are. Good. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so I think um, I'm going to let Steve just go ahead. What I'm going to do after he speaks, we'll have time for questions and comments and answers. Um, and um, I'd like to just get underway with you and not waste your good people's time. So um, without further ado, I give you Steve Hurley. Okay. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we're all waiting for spring. Everybody's in calling me up now. When are we going to stock the trout? Which is usually the rate of spring that I'm responsible for. And hopefully we're going to start trout stocking in the uh, rest of the district next week and possibly the week after the, the vineyard. Uh, but I've been the fisheries manager here since 1990. I uh, grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts, and I live there now. And I became interested in fish at an early age. And the reason I became a fisheries biologist was I was very interested in fishing for brook trout. I used to go up to my grandmother's house in New Hampshire and catch brook trout. And while I was up there, I saw a TV program about a fisheries biologist on there and the one channel that she got. And I said, that's the job for me. And so I've been lucky in life that I kind of knew what I wanted at a very early age. And actually, I uh, get the stock now the stream I grew up fishing in Hingham from Weir River. Uh, so like I said, I've been here since 1990. I went to University of Massachusetts Amherst and got a bachelor's in fisheries. And then I uh, got a master's from Iowa State University. Then I worked in the state of Ohio for six years before I came out here. And uh, now I'm basically stocked in the stream I grew up fishing. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is Millbrook um, here on Martha's Vineyard. And I'm going to kind of give you the history of the fisheries in Millbrook, uh, what we found on a most recent survey, talk about some of the temperature data, and then talk a little bit about uh, future fisheries possibilities for Millbrook. If somebody can get the lights. So basically, as a fisheries biologist, um, it all gets down to geology. It's the underlying uh, basis for any fisheries management. You have to understand the geology of the area you're going to manage. I mean, basically, Martin's Vineyard has uh, the terminal moraines here and then these outwash plains. It's very similar. It's almost like a microcosm of Cape Cod. We have the terminal moraines on Route 6 and 28 and then the outwash plains in Mashpee. I mean, one of the unique features of these outwash plains are these channels you see here. 
And basically those are outwash channels. As the glaciers retreated, there's a large amount of water that carved these narrow valleys. And in a lot of those valleys, uh, small streams developed. Now this is an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, we have Tisbury's Great Pond, and then you can see Millbrook kind of curving up here with a series of ponds on it. Uh, and then this other tributary, the Tiasquam River, further down. I'm not going to talk too much about the Tiasquam. I'm going to focus in on Millbrook uh, right now. But basically, you can see it's almost a flooded valley right here. You can see these distinctive <laughs> geologic features. And it's those distinctive geological features um, that caused a certain type of fish to inhabit these areas. You see, this is kind of, uh, Millbrook has changed a lot over the years from its original underlying geology. Uh, this is actually a topographic map from the 1890s. You can get this online from the University of New Hampshire Diamond Library, all these little topographic maps, which are interesting to show what the features were like, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And so this is Millbrook here, his old mill pond, uh, and a series of small ponds further up. And this is the beginning of Town Cove down here. Now the fish that was found in Millbrook originally was the brook trout. Uh, it's basically our native trout species, but it's not even a trout, it's actually a char. The only trout that we stock in Massachusetts is actually the brown trout, which is from Europe. So our native trout is actually what's called a char. And the critical thing about a brook trout is cold water. Cold water habitat is critical for the survival of these species. And its preferred temperature is about 52 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's a critical thing because the average temperature in this area is 52 degrees, and that's about the temperature of the groundwater. So that's ideal conditions for brook trout is kind of like the long-term average temperature in this area. Now, the brook trout's life history is basically they only live to be about three or four years old. Uh, they spawn in October and November, and they seek, up, seek out this upwelling groundwater in order to build a red or a nest, and that's where they lay their eggs. And so these eggs basically are in these gravel pockets um, bathed in groundwater until about late January or early February. And then they hatch out, and they become what looks like a little fry or a small trout. So this is kind of a typical brook trout at the end of its first year in life. Uh, you can see these things called power marks on there with its nice spots. The brook trout is probably one of our colorful, most colorful fish. In fact, if you look at, some people have the fish and wildlife plate, it's a brook trout on there. It's a very beautiful fish and it's our native trout. They only live about three years. Uh, the average growth is about four inches at uh, age one, six inches at age two, and nine inches at age three. It's a typical size for a, a native brook trout. The native brook trout were known to the Native Americans. There's an oral legend among the Mashpee Wampanoags that talked about how these rivers were formed. I mentioned nowadays we understand it as being geological formations, outwash plains. Well, the Native Americans had to come up with an explanation on how the rivers were formed. And basically, their explanation for the Santuit River, here it's listed as Katuit in this old topographic map, was a giant trout, the great trout, heard this Indian maiden singing uh, near what was called Trout Mound at uh, St. Truett Pond. And the trout kept on hearing her singing and he forced his way up the little tiny stream out of the ocean and carved the St. Truett River Channel. That's the, the Indian legend, the oral traditions of the Native Americans. Uh, and so the Native Americans did know about sea run trout. So it's a trout that's basically coming up from the ocean. So that gives us an inkling uh, that the Native Americans did know about these brook trout that lived in the ocean. <clears throat> but unfortunately, when the European settlers came over, they started modifying the landscapes of Massachusetts. And one of the first things that they did was to clear the land for agriculture. The Native Americans had been doing it a little bit uh, by burning the woodlands and, and growing some corn and crops like that. But when the Europeans came over, they basically greatly modified the landscape. Uh, this clearing of the land caused a lot of siltation in the rivers and it cut off the forest and increased runoff and made the streams flashier. So that was kind of the first major modifications to the streams of Massachusetts. The second thing that happened was uh, the building of mill dams. Uh, when the pilgrims came over, 
uh, to Plymouth in 1620, they didn't have a place to grind their grain, which is the way they grew up with in uh, England. And so basically they tried to develop a place to grind their grain. And so the source of power back in the early part of Massachusetts was water power. So they dammed up these streams to provide energy to grind their grain. And some of the earliest mills was uh, back in 1635 at the Deposit River up in Dorchester. But many of these areas had many uh, dams on them. This is a picture of Dexter's Grist Mill over in uh, Sandwich, an early mill. This picture right here was taken on uh, Herring River in Borndale, what was called the Monument River. Nowadays, we call the Monument River the Cape Cod Canal. But back in the 1700s, sport fishing was just developing. And the only people that could really go sport fishing were the wealthy uh, industrialists or the wealthy traders of the time. One of the first instances we have of uh, sport fishing that's been recorded was the diary of John Rowe. Everybody here has probably heard of Rose Wharf in Boston. Well, that was named after John Rowe. He was actually one of the owners of the Boston Tea Party ships. And in the 1770, he reported catching 10 trout up to 18 inches, which is, I told you that the average size of Massachusetts trout, these were giant trout. Well, he caught them from a river called the Monument River, which is no longer here. That's the Cape Cod Canal. But he recorded catching these trout, which were invariably sea run or salt or brook trout. Since then, southeastern Massachusetts became a very popular trout fishing destination. People used to travel a long ways to come trout fishing on Cape Cod. People like John Rowe, uh, Dr. Jerome Smith, who later became the mayor of Boston, Daniel Webster, Theodore Lyman III, who was actually the first commissioner of fisheries, which was the direct predecessor of my agency, and even President Grover Cleveland would come down to this area and go fishing for trout. Daniel Webster, supposedly it was a great statesman and orator, one of his most famous speeches was at the Bunker Hill anniversary, 50 years after the fact. And he gave this speech which was noted, oh venerable men is how it starts. And according to Daniel Webster's diary, the first living creatures that heard that oration was actually the trout in the Nashby River. So Daniel Webster was a very avid fisherman. And in fact, when he died, he died of injuries, injuries sustained when he was in a stagecoach coming from Kingston, and he later died of those injuries. He was actually going trout fishing. <coughs> and this is the fish that they were after, basically uh, the sea run brook trout. Basically the brook trout that go out into the ocean and come back at a much larger size. There's a lot more food in the, you know, in the ocean than there is in a tiny stream. And when they go out into the ocean, they develop this silvery sheen like a salmon. And that's how you can tell it's a salter when they first come back. Within about two weeks, they lose that coloration, though. The brook trout doesn't go out into the open ocean like the salmon. Uh, it sticks close by into the estuaries. And that's actually probably one reason why um, the brook, salter brook trout is still around and we really don't have any salmon runs anymore. They go out into Greenland and in these offshore waters with a lot of people trying to catch them, and a lot of factors that can influence their survival. But we still do have sea run brook trout here in Massachusetts. Now here on Martha's Vineyard, uh, I mentioned this Jerome Smith, who was actually a doctor, and he wrote one of the first books on fishing in North America called it Natural History of the Fishes of Massachusetts. And he actually developed his interest in fish when he was uh, a quarantine doctor on Rainsford Island in Boston Harbor. And I just happened to be out there one day looking at the inscriptions on the rocks, and lo and behold, I found his carving. 1826 on Rainsford Island, so it made the connection with fisheries. Uh, later, ichthyologists basically panned his work. He was a medical doctor. He really didn't know a lot about fish, and he kind of transferred the knowledge from Europe. So the later ichthyologists kind of panned his work as an ichthyology work, but he does have a chapter in there called Trout Fishing in Cape Cod, and it's a lot of good historical reference on what the fishing was like back in the 1820s, 1830s. And in his book, he talks about trout. In no place have we seen them in such abundance as in Dukes County upon Martha's Vineyard, in Millbrook, which we're going to be talking about today. So of all the places he fished in the early 1800s, they were in most abundance here on Martha's Vineyard at Millbrook. He talked about it in November, 
is being alive with fish. That's basically their spawning period. So he came out here and he was just amazed at how many fish there actually were in this stream. And he talked a lot in this book about streams that I'm still working on now, the Quashnet, the Childs, and the Mashpee River up on Cape Cod. But of all those streams, Millbrook was the best one in terms of abundance, according to Dr. Smith. Now, Martin's Vineyard has changed a lot since the time uh, when Smith was here. This was kind of before his time. You can see there was uh, sparsely settled in Martha's Vineyard. And so the next slide kind of shows what it was in 1871. It started to get more developed with roads. So in between these two periods of time is when Dr. Smith was actually out here fishing upon Mill Brook, which was the primary river on Martha's Vineyard at the time. It still is today. Now, brook trout in Massachusetts were once widespread. I mentioned that brook trout ideal temperature is basically the average temperature for Massachusetts, about 52 degrees. But they've greatly declined in abundance in Massachusetts compared to the uh, historical abundance. These days in red are where we still have known wild brook trout streams. You see the area I cover is very sparsely populated with wild brook trout streams. Uh, historically, almost every stream around here probably supported wild brook trout. And one of the reasons for that is dams. Massachusetts has over 2,600 dams. It probably has more, like three or 4,000 if you count all the cranberry bog flumes and all the minor dams out there. So there's been a lot of dams here in Massachusetts that have blocked uh, migrations of the fish and also warm the water and other detriments to fisheries. This is an example of a, a dam over in Westport uh, which still supports some wild brook trout streams. But dams basically do several things. First of all, they act as sediment traps. Whenever you're talking about sediment movement in streams, it's a function of water velocity. So if you have high water velocity, you can have large cobbles, large gravels. If you have slow velocity, that's when the silt drops out. So the dam basically creates a, a velocity drop, and all the silt that's up in the watershed will be collected behind these dams. They also block fish, fish passage. If you're a fish coming up to here, you're not going to be able to get over this. You can't jump. You can't climb up. You're not a walking catfish for the species we have around here. They also warm water. And also, the big issue nowadays in the state is the safety issue of these dams. Uh, you probably all saw the national news about the dam in Taunton that was going to wash out downtown Taunton. So safety is a big issue these days with dams. And because of the safety issues, if you're a dam owner, you have to bring the dam up to the current safety specs, which can be very costly. Now, a lot of these remnant dam structures are still out there throughout eastern Massachusetts. And basically what they do is they block fish passage uh, between their spawning habitats or refuge habitats. So a lot of these remnant structures are out there, but they're not really being operated for their intended use, which was to provide power back in the 16, 17, and 1800s. Because of all these dams in Massachusetts, by the, after the Civil War, actually before the Civil War, the fisheries in Massachusetts had declined so much uh, that people were concerned about it. And the solution at that time, they thought, was uh, the artificial propagation of fish. And some of the first propagation of fish in uh, the United States was actually carried out in Massachusetts. Below this, or near this area, this is actually a sandwich called the Sharm Pond area, the Sharm River. A guy named Nathaniel Atwood, he was a Provincetown sea, cat, uh, sea captain, he did some experiments on the propagation of fish. He was able to actually fertilize the eggs of the brook trout. Uh, they later died of fungus, but it was some of the first attempts at fish culture, and that was back in 1857, 1856. So that was kind of the start of trying to do something about the freshwater fisheries in Massachusetts. Now, dams and fisheries have a big history in Massachusetts. I mentioned the first dam was 1635 in the Ponset River. Uh, there was a lot of early dams on a lot of the small rivers in Massachusetts. Because of the impact of dams on fisheries, though, some of the first laws to protect fish in the United States were here in Massachusetts. And they talked about <coughs> opening up the mill dams to provide for the passage of fish, like alewife and other anatomous fish. It was actually in Falmouth, there was a noted uh, thing in the history books on the Cunemesic River, they called it the Fish War that people that were concerned about the alewives were so upset at the mill dams there that they filled the cannon with fish 
and they lit it off. <laughs> Unfortunately, the cannon blew up and it actually killed some people. And so there was actually some early fatalities uh, in the damn fish board here in Massachusetts. But by 1833, a lot of that damage had already been done. I mentioned Dr. Smith. He talked about thousands <coughs> of sawmills have done their part toward the work of extermination. And he was talking about the fisheries of Massachusetts. In fact, the dams in Holyoke and Lawrence led directly to the formation of the Massachusetts Fish Commission, which was my predecessor agency. The people in New Hampshire were so upset at the loss of the salmon, the shad, and the herring fisheries, they petitioned Massachusetts to do something <coughs> about it. And that was in 1865 and 1866. And we were actually one of the first fisheries commissions in the United States to be formed. It was because of the impact of the dams at Holyoke and Lawrence upon the anatomous fisheries of Massachusetts that my agency was formed. I talked about fish culture. We've been in the fish culture business for a long time. We just celebrated the anniversary of the sandwich fish hatchery a couple of years ago. It's been in operation since 1912. We've been trying to restore the trout fisheries of Massachusetts by hatcheries for over 100 years, basically right after the formation of the Fish Commission, they started stocking streams. But unfortunately, with all the stocking that we've done, we have not restored our native fisheries in most of the streams. And in fact, uh, with all the history of stocking, you know, there really isn't a lot of successes about restoring the native self-sustaining fisheries. Now here on, uh, in Millbrook, uh, there's been a long history. I talked about the history of the mill dams in Massachusetts. Well, Mill Brook has a very early history. That it was, when it was first purchased from the Native Americans in 1669, 1670, they talked about it as a place for grinding grain. And so these early mills were simple affairs. They were usually just made out of wood, um, and they only operated them when they were grinding the grain. Oftentimes, they wouldn't keep the water impounded, because if they did, there was a risk of overtopping and washing out the dam. So oftentimes, they just impounded the water long enough and when they had to grind the grain. Unfortunately, when the Industrial Revolution came around, many of these mill dams became more permanent structures, and they had long-lasting permanent impacts on the fisheries. This was taken from one of the histories of Martha's Vineyard. It shows a mill on Tiasquam, which became known as the New Mill River, and it shows a person fishing below the dam. Now, there's a reason why people fish below dams. It's because the fish can't move through the dams, and so oftentimes the best place to catch a fish like a trout is below a dam, because the fish is swimming up the river, trying to go somewhere, and it's blocked by the dam. So that's the reason why, oftentimes, the best place to go fishing is below dams. Since that time, we still stock uh, trout. Uh, this is a picture I came across in the files of one of the EPOs, or natural resource officers, stocking Mill Pond back in the 60s. At that point, we used to stock trout in Millbrook, uh, and also Millbrook and Chilmark, and Millbrook in West Tisbury. Uh, in this day, we still stock the trout here on Martha's Vineyard. We've expanded it over the last couple of years to four ponds. We don't no longer stock streams. We stock primarily small ponds here on uh, Martha's Vineyard. And actually, uh, the best trout pond here on Martha's Vineyard is actually one of the newest, Upper Lagoon Pond. Uh, and that's basically been changed over to a freshwater pond. It has the best trout habitat on the island. And it's that pond that we stocked brown trout in because it didn't have any native fisheries in there. Uh, so we stocked the brown trout in there. The other ponds we strictly stock with brook trout and rainbows for the most part. Uh, we don't stock the browns on top of our native fisheries. And also to give you a heads up here, uh, you'll be pleased to know that we will be bringing the first load of fish out to Rockford's Vineyard. It will be April 1st, uh, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. I just made the schedule to bring the fish out on the truck. And the reason why we're doing that is because of the depletion of our native fisheries. In order to sustain the demand for trout fishing, we have to rely on the hatchery fish these days. I'm going to talk about some of the surveys that we found recently. Uh, there's been some previous fishery surveys in the watershed. Uh, back in the teens and 20s, the 1900s, uh, there was fishery surveys focused in on the alewife done by Dr. Belding. And in 1988, there was a pretty comprehensive survey of Martha's Vineyard streams by Karsten Hartel of the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology and Fisheries and Wildlife. In 2000, we did a few stream surveys. And in 2008, a private consulting firm did a few surveys 
on Millbrook, which is in the packet, I think, that Prudy handed out as a summary table that I made. Now, I've talked a little bit about Millbrook, but what about Tisbury Grape Pond? Well, Tisbury Grape Pond, as I mentioned, is a, basically a flooded valley. And basically, the barrier beach creates a, a barrier here. It creates what's called a strand or barrier beach pond. And historically, there was an early commercial fishery for white perch in the 1900s. At that time, you could lease a body of water uh, to produce fish. And at that time, there was a commercial fishery for white perch that existed in Tisbury Great Pond. But until recently, basically, everybody thought, oh, we'll just stop fishing there, and they'll uh, produce more fish. Well, between 1916 and 1944, it was actually stocked with walleye which is a freshwater fish. That's actually what I worked on when I was in Ohio. I did stocking evaluations of walleye. Uh, it probably aren't suited for this type of pond, but they were stocked in there. Rainbow smelt, brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout have all been stocked directly in Tisbury Great Pond over the years. This is an example of some of the data that we have in our files, this historical summary. Uh, this was done by Dr. Zelding under the resolves of 1910, where they basically surveyed all the ponds in the state. And the idea at that time was to increase the production of food fish. And so they did scientific surveys of these ponds with the idea of promoting food production from the ponds. And they specifically mentioned the, the types of fish in here as being white perch, alewives, eels, a thing called frost fish. Uh, sea robins, blue crabs, and shiners. And they actually have this nice hand-drawn map in there uh, with color annotations. So that's just some of the data we have in our files, historical data. They talked about frost fish. Well, if you're a fisheries biologist, you know the frost fish is actually a colloquial name for a species known as the Atlantic tom cod. I'd be very interested to know if anybody has ever seen them in the pond recently because there is uh, a big concern about these type of fish being in decline. They're another anatomous fish. They come up in the winter, actually, and they spawn near the head of tide in some of these coastal waters. And they've experienced a significant decline in Massachusetts. So people are very interested to hear about reports of the Tomcod being around. This was actually uh, one I got up in Redbrook and where I am in Plymouth. Where